Welcome back to Introduction to Higher Mathematics. In our last lecture, we discussed a three-step approach to problem solving. We discussed the entry step in which we asked the questions, what do I know, what do I want, and what can I introduce? And we talked about how these questions help you set up your problem. We discussed the attack step, in which we tackle the problem itself, either by brute force or by trying to find a more clever approach such as finding a pattern. Finally, we discussed the review step, in which we check our resolution, reflect on key ideas and key moments, and extend to a wider context. Now, this is a great method for solving problems on your own. However, the question we're going to ask this time is a very important one. Once you've solved a problem, how can you convince somebody else your reasoning is correct? The way we do so in mathematics is called a proof, so that's what we'll be getting into today. Wikipedia defines a proof as follows. A proof is a demonstration that if some fundamental statements are assumed to be true, then some mathematical statement is necessarily true. In other words, given some sort of premises, we need to reach some kind of conclusion in a logical manner. The idea is that somebody else could look at your solution, follow it step by step, and reach the same conclusion. That's part of what you'll be learning to do in the beginning parts of this course. Right now, let's familiarize ourselves with some of the language of proofs and see how they're built. First of all, we need a starting point. Generally, when you're writing proofs, the first step is to examine your definitions. Or if the problem calls for it, make your own. So what is a definition exactly? A definition is an accurate description of a concept. It lays out exactly what something is. So for instance, I could define a sphere as the collection of all points some set distance from a fixed location in space. An important thing about definitions is that they require no proof whatsoever. If we had to prove our definitions, we would have to phrase our proof in terms of other definitions. And if we had to prove those too, well, you see how this could get out of hand. Another important thing about definitions is that they should be reversible. What I mean by this is that if you define something a certain way, and then you find something that fits that description, then it must be the thing you just defined. In other words, if I define a duck as something that quacks, and then I find something that quacks, lo and behold, my new discovery is a duck. So, if I've found a collection that happens to be all the points that are some distance away from a fixed point in space, then it must be able to be called a sphere. Once we have our definitions all taken care of, we often need to make some initial assumptions about them. These assumptions are called our axioms. An axiom, also called a postulate, is a statement that we accept without proof. For example, when we're working with the real numbers, we assume that addition and multiplication are commutative and associative. Once we have these axioms, everything we prove must be built off of them. Also, we want to make as few assumptions as possible. If rather than assuming something, we can prove it based on our axioms we already have, then more power to us. For example, in the real numbers, we may want to assume that any real number multiplied by zero will itself be zero. As it turns out though, and as we'll actually discuss later in the course, we can actually derive this fact based on a few more basic axioms. Of course, you'll have to stick around to see how. Anyway, once we've established our axioms, we can start building off of them and proving statements with them. We call these statements theorems, a term with which you may by now be familiar. Theorems are the discoveries we make in our journey throughout the world of mathematics. As we add theorems to our inventory, we can use them to prove more theorems, and use those to prove even more, and so on, gradually increasing our repertoire. An example of a theorem you may be familiar with is the famous Pythagorean theorem, which of course states that in a right triangle, if the two legs are labeled A and B, and the hypotenuse is labeled C, then a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Even though I'm sure you've used it countless times in high school, the Pythagorean theorem actually is particularly interesting because it's been proven so many times, in so many ways, by so many people, even including former President of the United States James A. Garfield. 
one notable proof was by the Indian mathematician Bhaskara II. Not because his method was particularly remarkable, but because his explanation consisted of a single word. Behold! As you can see, mathematicians can be quite excitable people. In practice, though, I tend not to recommend this rather concise sort of proof. Now, in some cases, the thing we want to prove relies on some smaller result that we haven't proven yet. What we do in such a case is we first prove this smaller result, sort of a mini-theorem, which we call a lemma, which is, of course, not to be confused with lemmings. A lemma serves as a stepping stone to our main result. Keep in mind, whether something is considered a lemma or a full theorem in its own right is only a matter of how it's intended to be used. Otherwise, there's no true distinction. Also, just because something is a lemma doesn't mean it's not important. Some of the most important results in mathematics are known as lemmas because they've been particularly useful stepping stones that lead to great results. Once we've proven a theorem, sometimes a number of other results follow very easily from it. For example, let's say I've proven that in an isosceles triangle, the circumcenter and incenter lie on the same line. In that case, since an equilateral triangle is a special kind of isosceles triangle, it's easy to show that the same is true for equilateral triangles. In fact, the circumcenter and incenter will be the same point. When we show that a result very easily follows from a theorem we just proved, we call it a corollary of that theorem. Often in textbooks, when a theorem has been proven, a number of corollaries will be laid out right after it, and will apply the theorem to a number of useful contexts. So, now that we've talked a bit about theorems, let's take a moment to look at how these theorems come to be. Many a well-respected theorem in mathematics had a humble beginning in some mathematician's head as a conjecture, an idea that's believed to be true, but hasn't yet been proven. Of course, many of these were soon verified after plenty of hard work, which may or may not have involved an entry, attack, and review phase. But there are a number of conjectures that still remain a mystery and are open problems today. In some cases, the proof of these conjectures would have wide-ranging consequences and applications, so sometimes mathematicians tentatively build theorems off of these conjectures. Once the conjecture is proven, all the logical steps are in place for those other theorems. One well-known conjecture that remains unsolved to this day is the Goldbach conjecture, insidious in its simplicity. Given an even number, which ones can be represented as a sum of two prime numbers? Let's look at some examples. 4 equals 2 plus 2, 6 equals 3 plus 3, 8 equals 3 plus 5, and 10 equals 5 plus 5, or 3 plus 7. So we can see that some even numbers can be made by adding two primes. Well, German mathematician Christian Goldbach conjectured that it's possible to represent all even numbers greater than 2 in such a way. The conjecture's been verified for all even numbers up to 4 times 10 to the 18th power. That's 4 quintillion. But so far, nobody has managed to come up with a definitive proof. We'll see just how elusive prime numbers are later on in the course. Let's take a moment to address another famous conjecture, Fermat's conjecture. Pierre de Fermat was a French lawyer and amateur mathematician, who was either brilliant or lazy, or most probably some combination of both. Consider the simple linear equation a plus b equals c. Are there any solutions to this equation for which a, b, and c are all integers? Well, the answer is an easy yes. The basic 1 plus 1 equals 2 from elementary school is just one of infinitely many solutions. How about the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared? Well, there are integer solutions to that, too. For instance, 3, 4, 5... 5, 12, 13, 7, 24, 25, and an infinite number of others. We usually call these Pythagorean triples. So, Fermat wondered, as I imagine some of you might wonder in your endless curiosity, what about a cubed plus b cubed equals c cubed? How about a to the fourth power plus b to the fourth power equals c to the fourth? Or, in general, what about a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n, where n is a positive integer. 
Now, one solution may have already come to you. Suppose we let a, b, and c equal zero. Then this will indeed be an integer solution to the equation. It's not a particularly interesting one, though. In fact, to some of you, it's probably quite obvious. In mathematics, we call this a trivial solution. Generally, we're only interested in non-trivial solutions to a given problem. This doesn't mean you should ignore the trivial cases, though. They are, in fact, solutions. So, the appropriate question now becomes, are there any non-trivial solutions to a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n? Well, Fermat conjectured that the equation will only have integer solutions for n equals 1 and n equals 2. So there are no solutions, other than the trivial one of course, when n is 3 or higher. His conjecture was inspired while he was reading a new edition of Arithmetica, the major work of the Greek mathematician Diophantus, who extensively studied equations with integer-only solutions. We'll get into Diophantine equations later. Fermat wrote about his discovery in the margins of his copy of Arithmetica. I have discovered a truly marvelous proof of this, which this margin is too narrow to contain. This was the frustrating thing about Fermat. Since most of his mathematical writing was in letters to friends, he didn't feel much of a need to prove his conjectures, so it was up to posterity to prove whether he was right or wrong. He made this particular conjecture in 1637. It remained unproven for over 300 years, until in 1995, British mathematician Andrew Wiles managed to put together the necessary pieces to prove the conjecture true and finally lay it to rest. Because Wiles was the one to prove the theorem, it was named after him and is known as Wiles' theorem. But because this was the last of Fermat's theorems to be proven, it is widely known as Fermat's last theorem. So, let's talk a bit more about axioms and why they're so important. One name that often comes to mind when we talk about axioms is Euclid of Alexandria, a Greek mathematician often referred to as the father of geometry. Euclid's magnum opus was his book Elements, in which he derived the principles of conventional geometry from a small set of basic axioms, five to be exact. Think about that. Five axioms to describe almost everything you learned in your high school geometry class. Let's look at these five axioms. The first axiom states that a line segment may be drawn between any two points. The second axiom states that a straight line may be extended indefinitely. The third axiom states that a circle may be drawn with any center and any radius. The fourth axiom states that all right angles have equal measure. Pretty simple assumptions so far, right? Well, let's take a look at the fifth axiom. The fifth axiom states that, given a line that intersects two other lines, if the angles made by those two lines with the first line add up to less than 180 degrees on the same side, then those two lines must eventually meet on that side of the first line. Whoa, hold up a minute. That's way more complicated than the previous four axioms. How can that possibly be something we're supposed to just assume? Well, this was a problem for Euclid, who put off using it for as long as he could, proving everything he could using only the first four axioms, until he was forced to use it in Proposition 29 in Elements. For many years afterward, countless mathematicians tried to use Euclid's first four axioms to prove his fifth axiom, which came to be called the Parallel Postulate, but nobody could manage to do it. What did come out of these efforts were a number of statements that ended up being logically equivalent to the Parallel Postulate. That is, one was true if and only if the other was true. Perhaps the most well-known equivalent of the Parallel Postulate is usually known as Playfair's axiom, named after the Scottish mathematician John Playfair. Playfair's axiom states, given a line and a point not on that line, Exactly one line can be drawn through that point that will be parallel to the first line. Anyway, after years of trial and failure, two mathematicians, a Hungarian named Janusz Boliai and a Russian named Nikolai Lobachevsky, began to think in a different way. They thought, what happens if we assume that Euclid's parallel postulate isn't true? Can we create a consistent geometry if we assume something different instead? 
and the answer was yes. Bolyai and Lobachevsky ended up discovering a new kind of geometry, a non-Euclidean geometry, called hyperbolic geometry, in which a line could have an infinite number of lines parallel to it that all go through the same point. This works because hyperbolic geometry can be thought of as taking place on a surface much like the shape of a Pringles chip, a horse saddle, or even a coral reef. In addition, German mathematician Bernard Riemann worked on yet another kind of geometry, called elliptical geometry, in which there are no parallel lines through that point. Think of elliptical geometry as taking place on the side of a sphere, in which the only lines are called great circles, which are circles of maximum diameter, kind of like the equator of the Earth. So the important thing to take away from all this is that the axioms you choose to work with are incredibly important. Simply altering a single assumption about the mathematical system in which you're working can drastically alter how everything looks and feels. So with all this talk about choosing the right axioms, the question might have entered some of your minds. How deep does the rabbit hole go? Is there some fundamental set of axioms that we can somehow use to derive the entirety of mathematics? This is a very intriguing mathematical, or rather, metamathematical, question, and one that was indeed explored by a number of mathematicians, most notably German mathematician David Hilbert. At that time, math was going through what was called a foundational crisis. A number of paradoxes were showing up in different areas of study, and mathematicians were scrambling to give their beloved field a firm ground to stand on. So Hilbert proposed that his colleagues should aim to find a finite set of axioms from which all of mathematics could be derived. These axioms needed to meet certain criteria, including completeness, which meant that all true mathematical statements could be proven by those axioms. Consistency which meant that the axioms wouldn't lead to any contradictions, and decidability, which meant that any mathematical statement could be shown to be either true or false using the axioms. Unfortunately, Hilbert's program, while noble in its effort, was soon shown to be futile by Austrian mathematician Kurt Gödel. Gödel came up with what were called the incompleteness theorems, which effectively showed that it was impossible to come up with a mathematical system that is both complete and consistent using a finite set of axioms. As it turns out, in any system we can come up with, there will always be certain statements that are not decidable given our axioms we've chosen. These statements may be true or false, but the axioms have no way of telling us which it is. So what does this mean for us in this course? Does it mean that no proofs are possible? Well, if that were the answer, I'm sure you'd agree that both this course and the entirety of math would be pretty boring. Even though we may never be able to find a finite set of rules that proves all of mathematics, we can always pick a set of rules to start with and then see how far they take us. And that is the journey on which we are about to embark. And with that, we'll stop here until next week's lesson, Propositional Logic. See you next time.